The changes between the 8th edition and the 9th edition of NRP or Neonatal Resuscitation Program are really not that massive, but we're going to go over them today and we're going to discuss 13 different changes. One, changes in the algorithm. There have been some minor changes to the algorithm that we've all come to know and love. One of them is that they added birth as a separate box. And also, they also added initiate cord management plan as a separate box. This is to really emphasize the importance of discussing and hopefully doing delayed cord clamping. If the baby is able to stay with the mother after birth, and remember, we talked about this in a previous video, better if the baby stays with mother. So breathing, term, and has good tone, the baby can stay with mummy then if the baby does get to stay with mommy, then the importance of skin to skin and maintaining adequate temperature control was also added to the algorithm. If the baby needs further evaluation, so is either not breathing or not term or does not have good tone, then the baby obviously stays with the team. And at that point in the algorithm, suction if needed was removed. Later it says clear airway if needed. But again, this is the NRP steering committee continuing to de-emphasize just doing routine suctioning on babies. We do not want to do routine suctioning on babies. Two, Terminology change. We always used to use the phrase PPV or positive pressure ventilation when we were referring to actually doing ventilation for the baby. Now the new NRP edition uses the term ventilation or assisted ventilation. Not a big difference, but it kind of goes along with the AHA terminology as well. Three, delayed cord clamping. In the eighth edition, it was recommended that delayed cord clamping should be given to all babies that don't need immediate resuscitation for between 30 to 60 seconds. Now, based on more evidence, this edition is recommending DCC for at least 60 seconds. So increased time of actually doing DCC. We just have to convince our OB colleagues. Four, the role of umbilical cord milking. So this is where the cord is like milked from the placenta towards the infant. And previously it's been done when they quickly wanted to get blood from the placenta towards the infant, but the baby needed more active resuscitation. So they wanted to get it done quicker. Well, in the eighth edition, this was not recommended. In fact, we definitely should not be doing this in all babies less than 28 weeks because it increases their risk of having a severe IVH. Obviously, that's still true in this ninth edition. We still do not want to milk the cord towards the infant. We do not want increased IVH. However, in this edition, they do say that there may be a role for umbilical cord milking in older babies. So in infants between 35 to 42 weeks that are born and are not vigorous despite stimulation, then milking the cord may be a reasonable option. So definitely not below 28 weeks, may be helpful above 35 weeks. Between 28 and 35 weeks, the jury's out. They don't really know either way whether this is, this is a good or a bad thing. Five, the target oxygen saturation table. This has changed just a tiny bit. Basically, they've removed the ideal oxygen saturation at one minute. This is obviously very logical because now we're trying to do delayed core clamping for the first minute of the baby's life. And as you all know, it takes a little bit of time to kind of put on the pulse ox and get it to start reading anyway. So it's still the same numbers, but it now starts at two minutes. Six. Initial oxygen concentration. This has also changed, and this has been based on studies that have shown that maybe the very premature babies will benefit from having a higher FiO2. In fact, several studies have shown that if a baby's oxygen saturation is at least 80% at five minutes of life, then there is a decrease in both morbidity and mortality. So basically, based on these studies, we were all kind of expecting that the recommended FiO2 in the delivery room was going to change. In the eighth edition, the recommendation used to be that for babies above 35 weeks, use 21% and below 35 weeks, use 21 to 30%. So two different groups. Now the NRP ninth edition has divided it into three different groups. For babies above 35 weeks, still use 21%. For babies between 32 and 35 weeks, so a new group here, then use between 21 and 30 percent. 
And for babies that are less than 32 weeks, use at least 30%. So basically, for all babies born less than 35 weeks, you could still be using 30% FiO2 and you could be following the algorithm. The key thing here is just the liberalization of the oxygen, especially in those tiny babies. And they do emphasize the importance of using a pulse ox to titrate the FiO2. But really, we should be trying to get these babies to 80% sats by five minutes of life. So give the baby the oxygen that it needs to get to that 80% sat at five minutes of life. There are more studies being done now, which will hopefully tell us more exactly what FiO2 we should be starting at, especially those micro micro preemies. Seven, ventilation rate target change. Long sentence. So again, the NRP does want to emphasize that ventilation is the most important aspect of resuscitating neonates, right? A lot more important to establish effective ventilation before we start going down the pathway of chest compressions. That was just a quick aside. But when we were giving ventilation, or what we used to call PPV, we used to give it at 40 to 60 breaths a minute. Now, based on recent evidence that babies can probably get the minute volume they need with a lower respiratory rate, the new recommendation is to give between 30 to 60 breaths a minute. This is great. It kind of extends the amount of acceptable rate that we can give. But also remember, when we are giving both chest compressions and we are giving ventilation to the baby, then we are normally giving the ventilation at a rate of 30 breaths per minute. Remember, we're going one and two and three and breathe, one and two and three and breathe. And the chest compression should be 90 times a minute and the ventilation rate should be 30 times a minute. So it also kind of goes along with the rate that we would be giving it if we actually started chest compressions. Eight, the initial PIP or peak inspiratory pressure for ventilation. In previous editions, the NRP recommended that we use between 20 to 25 centimeters of water when we're initiating PIP for ventilation. Now the NRP has broken it down into two groups, basically needing slightly higher PIP. Now for babies above 32 weeks, we should be starting with initial PIP of between 25 to 30. And for below 32 weeks, we should still be using 20 to 25 centimeters of water for the initial PIP. So basically the NRP really kind of recommends that for most babies, we should be starting at an initial PIP of 25. Nine, the time period before the ventilation corrective steps. If you remember the whole Mr. Sopa steps, which by the way, is still included in this ninth edition. It used to be that after 15 seconds of doing what you think is good ventilation, if you don't see an increase in heart rate or a chest rise, then you should start the ventilation corrective steps. Now that's been changed to 15 to 30 seconds, probably under the assumption that it takes a little bit longer than that to get everything moving. 10, the ventilation correction steps. In the eighth edition, it was recommended that the Mr. Sopa steps were done in that order, in M-R-S-O-P and then the alternative airway. In this edition, they still recommend thinking about all those different Mr. Sopa steps, but it doesn't have to be in that sequence and it should be tailored for what the baby is going through. So for example, if you do feel like the mask isn't providing a good seal, then obviously start with readjusting the mask, which is the M anyway, so you'd be starting with that. Or if you feel that the baby is just pooling a lot of secretions, then just go straight to suctioning rather than kind of going through everything else before you reach that. So you can still do it in the sequence, but if something else obvious is going on, then you should be attacking that issue first. 11, laryngeal mask usage. This is a huge one and the usage of LMAs is only going to carry on getting bigger and bigger. In previous editions, LMAs were basically only used as like the alternate airway. And even with that, basically people were still trying to intubate with an endotracheal tube anyway. So really they were previously only used if the face mask or bagging with ventilation was unsuccessful. And then basically intubating was unsuccessful or unfeasible. That's when LMAs used to be used. But now, according to the ninth edition, the actual bagging or the ventilation can be done with either a face mask 
or with an LMA. And honestly, a lot of centers are doing this already. And the advantage of that obviously is if the baby then does need surfactant or something, then it can be given directly through the LMA as well. So this is kind of a big change in the overall thinking of resuscitating babies. 12, endotracheal tube size recommendations. This has changed just a little bit. Basically, they recommend putting slightly smaller tubes in slightly bigger babies. So now the recommendation is, is that we put 2.5 ET tubes into babies up to 1.2 kilos. Do you remember that used to be one kilo? And then we put a 3.0 in 1.2 to 2.2 kilos, and then 3.5 and above 2.2 kilos. So I guess the new mnemonic could be 1.23. So above 1.2 kilos use a 3.0. That's always the hardest one to remember. The little ones you use a 2.5, the bigger ones you use a 3.5. So 1.23. And 13, the endotracheal tube insertion me measurement. These are all such long phrases. So it used to be in the eighth edition that where we measured how deep the endotracheal tube goes, it should be measured at the lip. Now it's measured at the upper gum line of the infant. This is thought to be more consistent. The NRP also, as usual, releases the tables of the recommendations of how deep the endotracheal tube should go based on the gestational age of the baby. Okay, those were the 13 big changes. We highly recommend that you take part in the course and you become NRP certified. It really is the crux of so much of what we do in the NICU. So study the book, do the course, do the simulations. There is so many different types of courses that the NRP also has available now, including a cardiac one. And in the meantime, if you are interested in even more neonatal education, then subscribe to our channel and think about joining our membership. We would love to have you there. I hope you're all doing well.